he's behind some of the recent cult hits of American independent cinema. Far From Heaven, The Velvet Gold Mine, I'm Not There and Carol sprung from the imagination of director Todd Haynes. With his star on the rise in the 1990s, filmmaker John Waters said he's restored my faith in youth. Now Haynes has tackled the true story of the lawyer who took on chemical giant DuPont. Dark Waters stars Mark Ruffalo, Anne Hathaway and Tim Robbins. Its director sat down with us to tell us more. Blue Ridge Mountain. That's DuPont. Better living through chemistry. It's our DNA. You need to tell me what in the hell's going on. DuPont is knowingly poisoning 70,000 local residents for the last 40 years. You knew, still you did nothing. You want to flush your career down the toilet for some cow hand? You want to take everything that you know and turn it against an iconic American company, like an informant. Isn't that right? Isn't that right? Isn't that right? Yes. Todd Haynes, hello. Thanks for joining us. Hi. In Dark Waters, we see something of a David and Goliath story, a corporate lawyer, an ordinary family man who takes on this industrial heavyweight, DuPont. And we see him guided by his moral compass, but also we see the very high price he has to pay for that. Is this a cautionary tale? Well, absolutely. I mean, I think it, it describes, you know, not only a kind of norm of corporate practices that this particular story unveils, and, and, but with tremendous labor and effort uh, for somebody who is so much within the belly of the beast as Rob Balot initi initially is, only somebody there uh, with the sort of allegiances, the fact that he is a corporate defense attorney already sets him up with the kind of financing and overhead and, and support system, but also the inside knowledge of how to crack a case like this and get to the information that a plaintiff's attorney simply wouldn't have. But uh, so it's a unique conflation of elements and people and, and time and place that make the story even something that could be told. Um, but it's cautionary in the sense that we know these kinds of practices go on all the time, but it takes a specific ear to the ground and a sense of perseverance and unique personalities like Rob Ballot to open it up and to then figure out a way to fight back. They should see what they done. You're right, they should. And, and it kills me that they won't. But that would mean going to trial and proving that C8 killed your cows. And every scientist who knows anything about any of this already works for these chemical companies. That's not an accident, Earl. Earl, these... These companies, they have all the money, all the time, and they'll use it, trust me. I know, I was one of them. The film's based on a true story and a very recent one, which must have made it quite delicate, if not controversial, to shoot, given that almost everyone in it is still alive today. What were the biggest challenges for you? The challenges, I think, were more about how to tell a story that has so much to do with accumulation of data and, and uh, discovery. Okay and make it compelling for an audience so that they could weather the arduous process that Rob Ballot himself undergoes, but feel connected to the ultimate goal and the fact that this is really affecting the lives of people of all kinds, of all walks of life. And so how to organize that amount of time over a near two decade narrative was the biggest challenge, I think, narratively. Being around the people themselves was a tremendous opportunity and a humbling one because they were able to be there for us, show us their homes, their lives, their places of work, and really open up and really offer us the specific details that help give the film a sense of authenticity. And we get the feeling that your protagonist feels crushed, demoralized by some of the injustices in, in the system he's working within at times, especially the sheer power that a company like DuPont has in a courtroom. What do you think it has to say about the health of the US justice system right now? Well, what you see 
is that corporations like a DuPont are willing and capable of criminal practices and obfuscation and deferrals and, and you know, shutdowns and blockades of any conceivable way of getting to the information while still accumulating that history of data internally. And so, but also being protected by uh, a uh, regulatory system that basically gives the prerogative to industry to decide when and how to report its, its uh, toxic, you know, chemicals. And so, that was something, this is an unregulated chemical. This lawyer had to find a way outside the legal system to catch them and make it something that could be indictable. And so this medical monitoring clause that just happened to get passed in West Virginia law right around the time that Rob needed it was really the only way that he could set up a system of expected uh, worry about a particular toxin and its effects on a community when that toxin was in fact unregulated. Has anyone even read the evidence this man has collected? The willful negligence, the corruption? Read it! And then tell me we should be sitting on our asses. That's the reason why Americans hate lawyers. This is the crap that fuels the Ralph Nader's of the world. We should want to nail DuPont. All of us should. American business is better than this, gentlemen. And when it's not, we should hold them to it. That's how you build faith in the system. And the class action suit against DuPont is sparked by a whistleblower, more or less. And that's a figure we've seen at places like Enron, the NSA, Cambridge Analytica in recent years. And those people have been applauded for their bravery. But how do you see their actions making a real difference? Well, it's, it's, it's only often ever the case of people who have that kind of inside knowledge, where Rob Balot, who l lived so closely to defending chemical, the chemical industry, uh, and worked with DuPont in their Superfund legislation and in myriad other ways of dealing within the regulatory system, uh, had direct and personal experience. And so it's these specific people who have the credibility to come out and speak and, and reveal what they know. Uh, but that is often a house of cards. And it, were it not for the fact that Taft went along with it and was able to put its own reputation, which is a remarkable thing on the line, to defend this case that would challenge the clients that they have and the standing that they enjoy within the culture that they live in. And, and yet they did. And so that took commitment and risk that was long, that went over a long period of time. Now, going from the poison emitted by DuPont to another sort of toxic element, you made a film in 1991 named Poison, which was critically acclaimed. And one of the episodes in that film references Jean Genet, uh, the thief's journal. Can you tell us more about your encounter with French literature and culture at that time? That takes me back to the very, very beginning of my film career in a very different time in our sort of cultural landscape. This was at the height of the AIDS epidemic. Uh, and Genet was a poet and a playwright who had meant a lot to me and a novelist, um, but whose particular radical position vis-a-vis -vis sort of this idea of standing outside the status quo and maintaining a defiance against uh, normalcy, and really identifying and, and in finding great political import in the whole idea of aligning homosexuality with almost a criminal uh, sort of identity. That was really part of his project. And it felt necessary at that particular time to fortify a lot of the guilt that and feeling of culpability that I think the gay community was feeling by the society at large, to say, wait a minute, there have been spokespeople in our cultural history who stand up to the status quo and who describe resistance 
in these particular ways, albeit in a poetic language, that can be particularly useful at this, at this time. And that was really why I looked at Genet and, and applied Genet in my own very American perspective and interpretation in that early film. And previous films of yours have often been carried by complex, well-developed female characters, thinking of Carol or Far From Heaven. Since you started making films that um, perhaps women reacting within a patriarchal structure, how have you seen them evolve on screen? Well, I think the fact that women have, you know, that there are more women directors at work today, I think, is a huge uh, part of a change that needs to be continued. But I'm not so sure that we necessarily are evolving in the way women have been depicted, uh, because I don't think it's necessarily about setting up the positive representation of women is the answer. I think it's about showing women and as people who occupy every possible kind of narrative uh, characterization. You know, in the 1930s, the films of Betty Davis described characters who are not necessarily positive representations of women, but it described an, a flexibility and a dexterity about female characters that women could depict anything and everything just like men have. Evil, corruption, culpability, goodness, moral, moral, moral virtue, and play the entire gamut of the human experience in movies. And there were audiences that were willing and interested in seeing women take the central role in those kinds of stories. And so that's more, I think, the kind of movies that excite me, where women get to play every possible moral and ethical position in, in storytelling the way men have always enjoyed. Ted Haynes, thank you very much. Thank you. He was willing to risk his job, his family, for a stranger who needed his help. The system is rigged. They want us to think it'll protect us. We protect us. We do.